So uh, it's an unusual picture to start with uh, Mount Sinai, and of course it's where the law was given, and it was a very frightening place to be uh, for anyone at that time. Uh, very unusual, very surprising, and uh, we have read together the portion. We're thinking today of the glorious assembly. The glorious assembly. And uh, we wonder what's this glorious assembly and what it's all about. But of course, it's nothing like an assembly in this, this uh, uh, world, uh, any assembly that we can have. So it was quite a, quite a, a shows where the people round about it there. I dare say it doesn't quite look like that, but it was frightening. It was serious. The law was given there and, and instructions for building the tabernacle. So it was a, a very uh, frightening, it was an amazing place for Moses, for the children of Israel there at that time. Right. So we're thinking of the glorious assembly. What is this glorious assembly? So before we think about the glorious assembly, well, what is it not? And of course there in verses 18 to 21, uh, you see there what it is not. Uh, it's not uh, something you would want, for you have not come to the mountain that may be touched and burned with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest, and the sound of a trumpet, and the voice of words, so that those who heard it begged that the word would not be spoken to them any more, for they could not endure what was commanded. And if so much as a beast touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or shot with an arrow. And so terrifying was the sight that Moses said, I am exceeding afraid and trembling. So that was it. That's what it was. Uh, but this particular assembly is not anything like that. There is a greater and bigger assembly in the future. And it is, of course, in some way, uh, there are those who have gone to be with the Lord, are um, the triumphant church, are, of course, uh, with God in heaven. The glorious assembly. Why uh, Mount Zion? And uh, it's, it's quite a, an interesting, the old city of, uh, of David. It was quite interesting, you know. And uh, Mount Zion. This is the only part of it, of course. And the temple was up at the top end. And David's uh, palace was then farther down. And uh, uh, he could see over the whole city of uh, Zion. Uh, the city of David or the city of Zion. And uh, it is a picture of the heavenly uh, Mount Zion, the Zion in heaven, the heavenly Jerusalem. Uh, we get these uh, symbols and these things uh, and uh, it's all pointing to what's in heaven, you see. And so the fulfillment of it, we believe, is in heaven. Now, I know there are those who will say maybe uh, want to see a little fulfillment here uh, in, in, at Jerusalem. Uh, but uh, it's uh, more seen in, that in the spiritual sense. But then uh, I would be accused of uh, spiritualizing, <laughs> you know. And uh, uh, that's, uh, that is one thing. But, uh, uh, you know, it's... it's uh, a, the Mount Zion, of course, as the Bible says and shows us here, is in heaven. And uh, that is the real thing. The real temple is in heaven, you see, where Jesus left. The, the one uh, that uh, Moses built, of course, the tabernacle and the temple then that Solomon built and Zerubbabel built uh, and, of course, Herod uh, um, finished, was... Uh, uh, you know, the temple there is only a figure, an example of the real one in heaven. And of course, God's presence was there, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. Well, it's really pointing to the heavenly Jerusalem, which we uh, uh, read about in Revelation. And here, of course, in, in uh, uh, a little bit through the Bible, Hebrews, and uh, then, of course, in 
the Old Testament as well, which we have to learn. The earthly, of course, is a picture of the heavenly. That's what uh, we're saying to get across. The earthly Mount Zion, the earthly temple then, that was later on, uh, that was uh, after David's day, you see, and Solomon uh, expanded it, made it much bigger. So the earthly is a picture of the heavenly. Right. So what is it? What are we thinking about this glorious assembly? What does the Bible say? And so the text we have here is to the general assembly, so they make something very important about it, and church of the what? The firstborn. Are you God's firstborn sons and daughters? That's the way God looks at it. Yeah, you know, uh, Israel was a kind of first fruits, a firstborn. He said, your firstborn son. And then again, the church, the called out people, are the firstborn sons and daughters of the living God. Firstborn who are registered in heaven. And so that's important, isn't it? There is the Lamb's Book of Life, and here is talking about being registered in heaven. That is a very important place to be registered. You know, we, there is a registrar, and your name would be on that here in, in, in Ireland or in Poland, whatever country you come from, uh, of course, when you were registered. But uh, it's a more important one to be registered after your second birth, to be registered in heaven. And so, to the spirits of just men made perfect. Uh, that, of course, is those... Uh, uh, believers who have gone to be with the Lord, who have uh, no more sin holding them, and they're with the Lord in heaven. And they're perfected. Perfect. That's something else to think about. And of course, uh, there is then the universal church. We see two aspects to the universal church. And so today we're thinking more of ecclesiology the doctrine of the church uh, and uh, uh, so it's uh, really thinking uh, one of these areas here the church triumphant what is the church triumphant are we trying to split it up uh, not really no it means those who have triumphed in this life have gone to be with Jesus gone to heaven they are the church triumphant and uh, some people might want to say they're still having a jolly time or that. But of course Jesus said, I go to prepare a place for you. And, go, and of course in John 14, and if that is important, isn't it? There is a place there and um, that's important. We don't fully understand it. And then there's the church mil mil uh, militant. That is, what is the church militant? It's a military term, isn't it? And, and uh, it means that we're here on earth, we're advancing, we are, uh, we've heard the call of the kingdom, and we are bringing the gospel to people. It's to go to different nations, to different people, and so we're praying for one another, and we're advancing in the gospel. So uh, the necessity, you see, of all those who need to be prayed for, going through the various trials and difficulties, and whether they're Christians or not, they need, of course, prayer. But uh, that is it, the church, the universal church, one area aspect of it, triumphant uh, in heaven, and the other is the church militant is here on earth, and advancing uh, the kingdom of God here on earth. It's the kingdom of God on earth is invisible, but in one day the kingdom of God will be seen, will be seen really for what it is. What is another name for uh, the church future? Where? get the name for this gathering. Well, it's from the Greek, Ecclesia. Had an original meaning of assembly, congregation, council, literally convocation. And it's really, we get that word in the Bible, holy convocation. It's a, it's a gathering of, it's a special gathering then, where it's a holy convocation, because you could have a town meeting, and then so, hear ye, hear ye, come to the meeting tonight, uh, uh, to, to meet, you know, you members of the town, you know, uh, the, 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 that would be the call, you know. And so, uh, the Ecclesia is from, uh, there's just those that come from the Strong's uh, 
a concord a strong say uh, 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 yes analytical concordance or the lex lexicon and uh, it really means ek is one word it's lazy ek out from and to it really means out from and to so there's all that meaning in 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 the greek you're called out of the world you're called to uh, to to follow the lord and uh, it's, it's a special. Then there's Kaleo, is to call. Kaleo is to call. It's from the root, uh, uh, it's the root word of Ecclesia. Uh, and uh, it's to call. So it's, it's properly then people are called out from the world to God. Uh, and it's the outcome being the church, the mystical body of Christ. That is the universal total body of believers whom God calls out from the world and into his eternal kingdom. That is the church universal, you see. And of course, we in the local church have to be a replica, uh, our part, or a, a symbol of the church universal. Uh, that is the only way the local people will understand something about the church and it's how we are going about things and growing and all that sort of thing that uh, they see, uh, is it a real church or is it not? Is the candlestick there? And that's what's important, isn't it? The glorious assembly then. The assembly of angels, of course. Uh, there's an assembly of angels that mentions uh, two here, doesn't it? Uh, in heaven. And uh, it <coughs> then it's, uh, uh, you know, in Revelation it speaks of those angels. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. So, the angels are praising God. The assembly of angels. Uh, we just take that as uh, picked a tag out of the text. Right? And then above it stood the seraphim. There's another band of angels uh, which you have to be looking at uh, especially. Each one has six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. So he was able to see and go in different directions, and, and uh, that was quite the seraphim, quite amazing. Uh, that's in Isaiah 6 2, of course. And the Lord, you see, reigns, let the people tremble. He dwells between the cherubim, let the earth be moved. The cherubim is, of course, another name for the angels. So it's the assembly then of the firstborn. You know, it's, it's a great invitation, isn't it? We're already thinking about the firstborn. Uh, firstborn sons and daughters. The firstborn of God out of this world. And so that is it. The church is the firstborn uh, drawn out of the world. And so it's a great invitation, isn't it? Remember Christian said, no, Christiana, wasn't it? She was a great lady, wasn't she, Christiana? It's well worth looking at that film, I suppose, again. Christiana. She says, I have an invitation from the King of Kings. And so, as she read her Bible, she saw this invitation. She was so excited about it, to have this invitation from the King of Kings. And so, uh, that was quite wonderful. So then, Jesus, of course, is the door, isn't he? He's the entrance. He's the way in. And uh, what's important about firstborn? You know, it was very important in Israel. The firstborn had the, the real uh, importance of uh, seeing uh, the, the estate, uh, and that would be s s sorted out. He would have the responsibility of the um, uh, family, and so uh, that was uh, quite, quite amazing, you know. Why firstborn registered in heaven? Well, that's uh, uh, what we've been thinking about. And they are registered. God has them registered. God knows their names, you see. He knows us each one by name. 
How amazing is it? He doesn't come when he spoke to someone uh, in the Old Testament. He didn't say, what's your name? No, he said, Moses, Moses. You know, the Lord, the Lord God Almighty spoke, Moses, Moses. He didn't say, uh, uh, you know, come here, you fellow, you shepherd. Uh, I want to talk to you. He didn't say that, no. And so, why he the first one? They're registered in heaven. Our names are there in heaven. That is so wonderful. Our new babies registered? Yes, of course. Uh, we've learned a lot about registering of babies, you know. And uh, they're important. They have to be registered at a certain time after they're born. And, uh, and new babies in Christ are registered. Registered in heaven. How amazing, isn't it? God's plan. God's plan to save us. We were thinking about that yesterday, weren't we? God's plan. He planned our salvation. And who? Christ's payment. He's paid for our sin on the cross. The payment of a debt. The payment for our sins. And then the Holy Spirit's pleading. The Holy Spirit pleading with us and drawing us to, to trust in him. So it's, it's the great work of what? The Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. None of them is, uh, uh, you know, can sit and say, oh, well that's your job, uh, uh, Father. You, I, I, I have nothing to do with me, you know. Uh, and you, Jesus, you've gone today. And so, no, no. They're all working together, you see, in the great plan of salvation. The great plan of redemption. And so what about repentance? That's important, is repent therefore and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so that times of refreshing may come from where? The presence of the Lord. That is the, it's the great thing to know this refreshing in our souls, to know that uh, safety and security in him. That is the great thing. And it's pleading for God to be merciful, isn't it? Pleading for God to be merciful uh, on souls, you know, that they don't know. Maybe some people yesterday didn't know why they're here in this world, what was necessary, and, and the great thing to, if they realise God has a plan for them, and they need to know his salvation. They need to trust in him as their Lord and Saviour. God is on the throne, isn't he? Revelation 4, 1 and 2. And Jesus Christ has, has it, says it there for the first time, makes it a door opened into heaven. He has provided that, you see, way in. God is, of course, the judge of all, isn't he? And it's that final perfection, isn't it? That the moment we leave this scene of time, uh, you know, it takes off the spirits of just men, uh, literally. Uh, ones, the Greek, uh, just ones, uh, made perfect. And how is that? You see, it's when we die, at that moment, we are prepared for our exit into heaven, and that we are made perfect as we come to, as we meet our Lord at that time. The believer then, we believe that the believer at death leaves the church militant and joins the church triumphant. It's all one universal church really, but there's these two sides to it. Even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised, even at that time. When he called the Lord the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. What did Jesus say? For he is not the God of the dead, but of the living. For all live in him. What an amazing statement, isn't it? That's what our Saviour, that's what Jesus is explaining. That those who believe us are not really dead. They're with the Lord in heaven. And one day there'll be the resurrection and the bodies will be raised and they'll be joined together to be a complete person with their souls in heaven. An invitation from the King of Kings. How wonderful, isn't it? That's the greatest invitation, isn't it? That's a wonderful invitation. 
is an invitation to the Hebrew Christians. Uh, that's where the book was originally written to. Uh, and you, and me. Yeah. That's an invitation to us. And it's an invitation to the universal church throughout the world. It's an invitation that convinces you. you know, very convincing invitation. And it's an invitation guaranteed we look at. A guaranteed, uh, you know, that's the great thing about it. It's not something, well, maybe so, or, or anything like that. Uh, no, it's an invitation guaranteed. All right? So, how can we face God in heaven? How can we face God in heaven? Well, he, we have our mediator, don't we? The Lord Jesus Christ. It speaks here in the passage of our mediator. To Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant. He's mediated this new covenant for us. And to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. Yes, the shedding of Abel's blood speaks something. That he died, uh, you know, uh, he, he gave his life. But really the death of Jesus Christ speaks far more. Because his death didn't save anybody. He, he was an innocent victim. Uh, but uh, Jesus Christ is, is uh, victorious. He's died for our sins. He's died to mediate us. He can mediate for us. And uh, all we, we all we just left with Abel is his works, that he trusted God. He, he followed God. He, he, he was obedient to God's way and offered the right sacrifice. Why a mediator? Well, you see, the reason for the, one reason for the mediator is we want it to be like God. Remember in the Garden of Eden? Uh, you know, uh, the devil uh, told Eve, you can be like God. You can know good and evil. Well, they knew all about being good. Never sinned before. But now for the first time they're going to experience sin, change, and loss in favour with God. They wanted to be like God, and no, no, that was not the answer, was it? That that would not, that wouldn't be right. They couldn't be like God, and so we fell out of, fell out with God, isn't that right? And sin came in. That was the sad thing. We needed someone without sin to talk for us. The only one that was without sin was the God Man. The only mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. He was the only one who could talk for us. He's the only one who could fit the bill and, and uh, uh, be our mediator and to bring our cause before the throne in heaven. But first of all, he had to die on the cross to be our mediator, to be our saviour, to save us from our sins. And why a new covenant then? Why this new agreement? Why this new covenant? Why would the old covenant not do? What well, he did, it says in Hebrews that the old covenant was obsolete. It had done its time. It was only pictures. As, as we show for, you know, we have these uh, illustrations and pictures for children. And, and uh, it was an illustration. It was a picture. But now we have this new covenant, this new agreement. And, of course, the blood of the Lamb was a pointer, wasn't it? That was in the Old Covenant. And, and Jesus, of course, is the Lamb of God that came to take away the sin of the world. And the blood of Jesus was reconciliation, peace through his death on the cross, we often say. And the blood was God's price for sin. It was so serious that his only son, had to shed his blood to pay for our sin, to redeem us. And then the blood appeased the wrath of God. The blood appeased the wrath of God, you know, turned it away, in other words. And Jesus died for our believers that day. He died for all those who would believe and trust in him. Didn't die in vain. The human sacrifice was no use. Even Abram, Abel's blood. Anyone who died, a human sacrifice would be no use because they were sinners. Even 
Abel couldn't save anyone. He, sp he, sp he speaks all right, you know. Uh, there's something he speaks that he was a man, an innocent victim, and that he was uh, righteous, he had faith in God. Do you see what the lovely Lord Jesus Christ has done for you? That's the great thing to, to meditate, to contemplate on that, and to see well, what he's done for us. Right? How amazing, isn't it? He's such a saviour. He's such a redeemer. Right? He willingly said, I die for this people. Yeah. He said, I will go. Uh, uh, we, we, we feel like uh, trying to enter into the council of God in, in heaven in eternity and Jesus uh, knowing that man would sin and uh, uh, what would they do uh, Jesus uh, came for God's son came forward to say I will die for this people and the whole thing is to see Jesus there for you and for me for his people, for his church, his love in his own, right? We sing in one of the hymns, the old hymns. And so it's an inv invitation from the King of Kings, from the royal throne room in heaven. No higher court, no higher place, no higher throne, no higher place of ruling this world that all will have to submit to and bow to one day. Why a mediator? Well, we need him, don't we? And why a new covenant? The Lord Jesus Christ is the only one who can mediate. And the new covenant is necessary, a new agreement to save us from our sins and to, to redeem us. And really it's for reconciliation, to reconcile the man to God. So we want to thank you for listening. And let's pray. And gracious God, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercies. We thank you for uh, the church of the firstborns whose names are registered in heaven. We thank you for the church uh, here, militant on earth, advancing on, Lord. We oftentimes can be very weak. And we're more maybe like a, a hospital ward than, a, than, a, than, a, than a one who is advancing um, and we pray, Lord, that you will lead and guide by your Holy Spirit. We pray your blessing. We ask, O oh Lord, that we know your help and strength. We pray your guidance in Jesus' name and for his sake and glory. Amen.